Taming Lightning is made available by blog, podcast, and video for educational purposes only, as well as to give you general information and a general understanding of plasma and neon, including the following topics, but not limited to, high vacuum, electrical, and chemistry. By using the information, you understand that any and all instruction provided may be of incomplete knowledge and is not intended to be used without professional guidance and supervision. Taming Lightning Podcast is supported by the Pittsburgh Glass Center, a nonprofit public access glass studio and one of the top glass facilities of its kind in the United States, with knowledgeable and friendly staff and a safe, fun atmosphere. Our community is made up of artists, collectors, college students, or just those fascinated by glass. Depending on your interest and schedule, there's a class for you. Be it a two-hour introductory workshop, eight-week classes, or five-day summer intensives taught by artists from all over the world. This spring, starting in March, I'll be teaching a two-night hands-on workshop for creating plasma globes. On the first night, you'll be working with me to create your globe, adding color and pushing and pulling the glass. And on the second night, you'll see your piece filled with neon gases and light up before your eyes. This class does not acquire any glass experience and mostly geared toward those local to Pittsburgh. For those with more glass experience, you may want to consider taking this summer's five-day intensive called Light Up Your World with Plasma, taught by Wayne Stradman and Mundy Hepburn. This class is running from August 6th through August 10th, where these two scientists, alchemists, engineers teach you about plasma, give you hands-on experience, and help you reach your goals for a finished product. This class will be located in the Flame Studio and be focused on various torches and flameworking techniques, where Wayne's focus lies on the use of borosilica glass, which is a very strong, easy working, and enables fine details. Mundy practices the use of soft glass from the furnace, which melts easily and flows smoothly as he manipulates them with gas air torches. You'll be able to explore and experiment with both these methods. Then proper use of power supplies will be discussed, demonstrated, and studied and safety considerations are a priority. For more information, check out Wayne and Mundy on the web. As of this episode, three have already signed up, taking advantage of the early bird rate. This discount lasts until February 1st, and will rise to full rate on April 15th. If you know you'd like to take this class, take advantage of the early bird registration price. For more information, please check us out on the web at pittsburghglasscenter.org, or call our studio at 412 412- Three six five two one four five. Welcome back, or welcome to the Taming Lightning Podcast. I'm Percy Eccles the Second. I am the creator and host of Taming Lightning as well as an emerging neon lab tech at Pittsburgh Glass Center, where I'm learning and developing a space for exploring plasma and neon light. Taming Lightning is an educational blog and podcast about the art, science, and history of plasma and neon light. Looking beyond its associations with novelty and sign making, and to explore the potential of rare or noble gases by learning about those that use them. We'll be talking with artists, makers, and researchers, each guest offering their unique knowledge and experience. The intro is Boost by Joachim Karud. Joachim is a Swedish artist who loves to produce chill and happy music, and does so for copyright-free use. Be sure to support his music by giving credit when used, subscribing, and or by donation. You can find him on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify. In today's podcast, we'll be talking with Kiki Jewell. Kiki is a software engineer who has been captivated by light since she was a young girl, and yet found herself creating as a metal sculptor and 3D graphic artist, while also making light sculptures through the use of EL wire or electroluminescent glow wire, fire, and of course, neon and plasma. Introduced to Neon in 1992, she's educated herself through classes such as those taken at the Crucible in Oakland, California, Penland School of Crafts in North Carolina, as well as learning from prominent artists such as Bruce Suba and Ed Kirshner. She is one of the founding members of BANG, the Bay Area Neon Group, 
which is a small studio for those interested in learning and working in neon. After starting a family, Kiki has just gotten back to making her own plasma work and will be sharing with us about what she does and how she found herself working in neon. Oh, there's so many ways to answer that. Um, I'm a software engineer. I'm actually coming back into tech after a long break. Um, and then I do, I, I do art and kind of a, almost everything that's illuminated. I got, I got a, a little bit of a name for myself at Burning Man because I was doing uh, fire art. Uh, I also got interested in electroluminescent wire through Burning Man. Um, mm -hmm. I pretty much all always had um, an interest in things that glowed. <laughs> well, thinking back on my history on that, uh, when I was when I was little, I had a birthday party where we all took glow in the dark paint and painted all over ourselves. I think I was probably eight years old. That was probably the first start. I just got so excited that you could have things that lit up. It didn't just reflect light, but actually had light coming from inside. I just, I was completely captivated by that, by that idea. So I fell in love with glow in the dark paint and black lights when I was a kid. Uh, the last thing is like, would you consider yourself more of a, a maker or an artist or a, how, how do you define yourself in this case? when it comes to using these kind of neon or any type of glowing or techy items? I actually have a, a, I'll admit that I have a little bit of a chip on my shoulder about that. I'd, I'd kind of consider myself more technology oriented and engineering oriented. And I think the reason for that is, you know, from an early age, I was interested in computer programming as well as art. I love to draw and I, I love to program. Uh, fractals in particular uh, and computer graphics were where I spent a lot of my time. But uh, I found when I talked about my art, people tended to focus on my art and, uh, and tended to like not take my technology seriously. And so kind of from an early age, I, I learned not to talk about that I was an artist. People just didn't take art seriously. And as soon as I kind of attached myself to art, then my technology side, my engineering side was, uh, was disregarded. So I, I tended to kind of have a chip on my shoulder in, the, in that way, and I tended to talk to other people about my computers, but then would dismiss my, my artwork. But they were always intertwined. Um, in, in college, I worked in computer graphics. Uh, I wrote renderers. So, you know, again, this is kind of that tip, chip on my shoulder. I try to tell people that I, I did um, computer graphics technology. So, you know, I, I did line drawing programs in assembly language and uh, kind of the really hardcore stuff. I wrote a ray tracer. I wrote a, a renderer. Um, I really took to linear algebra. I loved linear algebra. Um, and then from, from college, I ended up getting a job at Pixar. So uh, the computer graphics and the artwork really served me. But I, if I had taken two more classes, I took so many art classes in college just for the fun of it. I never took it seriously. But if I had, there were two more art classes, if I had taken those, I would have had a double major in art and computers. And that probably would have served my career to have both of those majors. Hmm. But one of those classes, uh, in fact, uh, let me back up a little bit. Um, I got interested in glass blowing when I went to uh, a, a tiny little art school in North Carolina. I grew up in North Carolina, uh, an art school called Penland. And I went there for four weeks. Uh, at the time, I was studying um, metal smithing. I took a little class in doing silversmithing, and that was really fun. But when I saw them blowing glass, they were blowing glass, you know, of the glory hole and the whole pipe and, you know, making large vessels. I, I just was completely captivated. And so I kind of fell in love with glass. But I never really pursued it, never really thought to pursue it. And then when I was in college, I was, you know, I kind of read the, I read the uh, cat, the class catalog, kind of cover to cover, just to see what was out there. And uh, I stumbled on a neon class in college, and so I signed up for that. Never thought I could ever do that, and the thought of taking a class was just so exciting. And um, so I took that class, um, but you know, they they introduced us to the fires and and let us try it, but uh, we didn't really get to do much glass bending. It was more neon design, so mm -hmm. we drew sketches. And then we turned those into the local sign shop, and then they made the neon for us in the class. And I, I found that to be really disappointing. That was probably 1992, maybe 93. I don't remember the exact year. But um, but I always kind of held on to that, but I didn't think there'd be another chance to get an opportunity 
to, to get my hands on neon. And then uh, in the early 2000s, uh, maybe 2000, 2003, 4, maybe somewhere in there, um, there's a, an industrial arts school here. It had just started uh, at that time, and they offered neon as uh, a class that they had. These were just kind of hobby classes. You know, they're famous for their welding classes and, and uh, industrial uh, arts like that. And, um, you know, the, there's a uh, Burning Man is very, very popular here. It's uh, started in the Bay Area, and it's, um, you know, large-scale sculpture out in the desert of Nevada. And uh, kind of the Bay Area clears out when Burning Man season is. That's in the end of August, beginning of September. Mm-hmm. So the Crucible kind of serves that that art crowd and people doing large-scale sculpture. But they offered three three different neon classes. They had beginning neon, and then they had intermediate neon, and then they had a plasma class. The uh, um, the neon classes were taught by Christian Sheese. Uh, I think that's how you say his name. Uh, he was just fantastic and really gave us a full range of of understanding all of all of the aspects of neon. So we got to get into the fires and make our own artwork. That was just super exciting. He did all the processing himself, but we could watch him process the tubes and understand that that part of the the process. That was very exciting. And then Ed Kirshner, very famous for his plasma artwork, he taught the uh, the plasma class, and the the class the plasma class was taking um an old recycled bottle and putting electrode on it using uh, a glass solder. Um, that was the technology he developed this glass solder. So you'd put the electrode on the, on the bottle and then it would process overnight in a kiln and then come out and then he could then process it on the, the manifold and fill it. And uh, again, that was yeah. just so super exciting. So the, a lot of us students in, in those three classes, we were all like, Oh, I want to build my own neon shop. And, at the time, I was out of work, and I, I couldn't afford to build my own neon shop. I didn't have disposable income at that time. And um, so I, I proposed that we all pool together our resources and build a neon shop together. And then that's that's what we did. We started um, a group called uh, Bang, B- Bay Area Neon Group. Uh, it's a little bit of a play on the, the, uh, the subway system, which is uh, BART, Bay Area uh, Rapid Transit. So we are called Bang, and so um, it was really just a just a handful of us. And uh, in particular, um, Matthew Harper uh, found uh, a sign shop that was being sold, and uh, it was only three thousand dollars. He put up the money, and then together we built uh, a full, a fully functioning neon shop. Uh, we had a, a studio space in San Francisco, and. Uh, and we had everything. We had neon and argon on the manifold. We had a, uh, I built a kiln so we could do single electrode um, work as well as uh, we had a bombarder that came with the neon shop. We set that up. Um, mm. And uh, it's just a fully functioning shop. It was very exciting. I remember one day you know, I had all the screws all put away in little boxes and all the boots I needed and the wire and everything. I remember walking in one day and just kind of, I want to make something and pulled a piece of paper off, drew something, bent the glass, processed it. I had all the standoffs and everything I needed and, and had a completed piece of artwork by the end of the day. It was, it was just exciting to be able to go from start to finish all by myself in this shop. And it's a, it's a really incredible resource. And then uh, it kind of continued the history that was uh, about a, 11, 12 years ago, and I started a family, and I was kind of the central figure of this shop, and um, we ended up, the that studio space was sold to a developer, as so many of these artist spaces are, and uh, we moved to an artist space in Oakland, and we moved to Oakland as well, so we live here now, we bought a house, and um, this studio space has really not seen the light of day Um in those intervening 10 years, my, my daughter now is 11 and she's a lot more independent and doing her own projects now. So I've kind of come into a place where I can start doing my artwork again. So I've started getting back into it and kind of finding that like riding a bike, a lot of this stuff comes naturally. And so now we've got a couple new members that are very enthusiastic about this club and are, you know, kind of calling me up and saying, Hey, can we, can we go to the shop? And you know, I'm like, well, I was kind of busy, but let's make time anyway. And so now I'm, the the shop is is running again. It's very exciting. Zach, Zach in particular will, will say, oh, what's that over there? It's like, well, that's the bombarder. He says, well, does it work? Says, well, it worked. 
when we were in San Francisco, it's not hooked up. Well, can we hook it up? Can we hook it up right now? <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> so the shop is very rapidly getting back to full functionality. Um, in fact, uh, his friend Yasha is also coming over a lot and saying, hey, can we do this? Can we do that? And he said, hey, there's a box down here. It says Burrow Silicate Torch. Can can we get that running? <laughs> so Zach and Yasha kind of, kind of, you know, kind of whipped me into shape. And now we've, we just set up the Burrow the Burrow Torch just a couple weekends ago, and I kind of need to work in Burrow. I'm pushing the glass so hard that lead glass is just such, you know, such a difficult medium to push as hard as I'm as I'm pushing it. So I'm very excited to move forward. So there's the whole history of of the Bay Area Neon Group, um, very small group, and um, it was a East Bay Maker Fair that just happened this weekend. That's what I was doing instead of being in the shop. <laughs> I ran into two more people that are very excited about this resource, so they're they're they want to come over and see the shop and start using it. And um, and then also a couple weeks ago, well, actually I guess about a month ago, I had a friend of mine. Um, I know him through electric car stuff. I also have interest in electric cars, but that's a whole another another talk. Mm -hmm. But he has a friend who was working at Tesla, and he got interested in Nixie tubes and talking to his friend, he says, I want to custom make a Nixie tube. And so my friend Otmar said, called me up and said, Hey, can you make Nixie tubes? And I was, I don't know. I've never done that before, but come on over. Let's see what we can do. And he had some that weren't working. So we smashed those up and took the parts <laughs> out and processed them in the, the, the kiln. And that worked out. We got it to light up. That was very exciting. So now, now I'm embarking on how to make Nixie tubes. So I'm starting to read on the web. I have a friend, Bruce Suba. Uh, I don't know if you've talked to him. He's fantastic. Really incredible plasma artist. Been doing this for amazing guy. Yeah. He's just, Oh my gosh. He's so amazing. He knows everything. He, he has, he knows everything. He's connected to everything. So he's just the fount of wisdom. So he and I have been, uh, have been talking about Nixie tubes and, um, you know, how to, how to get that working. So anyway, there we go. So lots of activity and this has all been just kind of rolling forward. Now sometimes things get momentum and then roll forward. So <laughs> that's where we are. I'm kind of buzzing back into the shop. I haven't been in there in, in a couple of weeks. So. Yeah. It seems like neon is like a perfect merger of your interests, both in uh, technology and the uh, artistic as a maker and artist. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of what we, we do fall into those loves and when we have multiple loves, they tend to find a way to cross. <laughs> in fact, I was, um, I was kind of joking with my husband. We were talking about how induction motors work in electric cars. And, uh, I realized that I have, uh, three different directions that I can understand that is both the, the neon aspect of it. I, you know, I have, in working with single electrode stuff, you, you kind of get a sense of how the field, the electric field is moving out into the world. And then my husband is a part of a group that has this eight foot tall, crazy giant Tesla coil. They have this suit that they can go in and get their, you know, and get struck by lightning. And so I, the, he's been a part of that for over 15 years. And so I, you know, I'm, that's his, that's his thing. I, I kind of let him have that hobby on his own. So I, but I experienced that and, uh, you know, one of their members is, uh, he's one of the first, um, employees at Tesla. He's a, their firm, their head firmware engineer mm -hmm. <clears throat> and he's a part of that. So I talked to him about electric cars, um, and then, uh, and then electric cars themselves. So I was telling him how all these three things kind of come together and how, the, as he was explaining how induction motors work and all of that applies to, you know, the technical issues that I deal with, with the single electrodes stuff. I was thinking about that as, you know, thinking about this podcast and, and what to talk about. And um, I'm, I'm right now, like the last six months, I have this piece I'm trying to get finished and I'm dealing with all these technical problems. And uh, it's kind of really stretched my brain in, in the engineering part of it. Um, the, the piece is uh, only about nine inches, 10 inches tall. It's just one small thing. I'm doing a little rocket and it's about 10 inches tall. And I'm using a Tech 22 single electrode transformer. It's only a 3K transformer, but apparently I have I've been having these long talks with their technical guy there, and um, apparently it's not enough load for this transformer. I thought it might be the opposite that it you know it's too much or something, but 
he said, no, he said, could you add another tube? <laughs> it's kind of hard to do that when you have a vision to mm -hmm. just kind of throw another tube in there. But, um, so I, you know, I put a whole bunch of heat sinks on it. It's it, the transformer itself is getting up to 160 Fahrenheit. That's just way, Whoa. way too hot. Yeah. It's just not, it's not safe. I'm not, not comfortable with that. You know, I'd like it to be like, I could, I could handle 120, 120 is a little too hot to touch, but you know, it's kind of like hot tap water, but, um, I put a, I put a bunch of, um, heat sinks on it, but it still gets about 140. I'm afraid mm -hmm. if I put it in a window it with light on it, it might, you know, might melt down. I just am not yeah. comfortable with that. So, so I, I figured out another way to add another tube to it about the same size. I have a little smoke ring where the rocket's landing. And, um, so I added that he, you know, he said that he, the single electrode transformers are, are capacitively coupled. So you're not just talking about the, that main wire that comes out that's lighting your piece, but also, you know, that the rest of that electricity has to come back, right? has to come back to the transformer and that comes back through the air. And so uh, he suggested hooking that tube up to the ground wire. So it's hooked up to the ground wire, but it's still 140 Fahrenheit. And I'm not, I'm just not happy with that. So it's all very, it's very complicated how this, how this works. Um, so, uh, you know, I've, I've experimented with the, the amazing one transformers. Um, you know, they, they kind of, I, I prefer the tech 22s because they're UL listed and they, they're just, I just feel more that they're more professional. Um, but I am kind of starting to now take apart the, the amazing one transformers and seeing if there's any way that I can kind of scale them down They They also are, run hot when I have these little, these little pieces that I'm doing. So I'm trying to see if there's a way I can scale them, scale them down, maybe put some kind of pot that I can reduce the power and see if I can make it so that it's uh, running in a safe manner. But there's so much engineering involved in this, in this stuff. You know, when I, I used to tell people, I mean, you know, I do the neon art and, you know, people again, latch onto that artwork part. They don't realize how much engineering is involved. And so, I realized I started telling people I do high voltage plasma artwork. <laughs> then they <laughs> kind of sit up and pay attention a little bit, a little bit more. Yeah, it definitely so, brings um, attention back to the the uh, engineering portion, at least the portion beyond beyond the art. Beyond yeah, the I, I yeah, I feel like you know, I feel like the boys get a lot more attention because their their stuff is more geometric, and so you know, the, the technology kind of comes out a little bit more The engineering comes out. People pay attention to that, to the engineering as well as the art. I think when, with this much more, um, geometric stuff that I see the boys do. So I've been, um, you know, my stuff is so, is much more organic and, and, uh, involved. There's a lot of natural stuff that I do, even though I've been taking this direction where I've been doing these little airplanes and rockets and stuff more, more science fictiony. Those have been a lot of fun, but um, I'm I'm kind of drawn back. I've done, been doing a lot of sketches of birds. I want to get back to doing birds and flowers because, and even underwater scenes that those so lend themselves to the to the ethereal thing of where things glow from the inside, inside coming out. So, so yeah. So you have a very intimate knowledge on the. Uh, the engineering portion of of neon and that that's certainly something I'm lacking myself um, is that understanding uh, and I do uh, understand uh, the kind of puzzle that's created by neon and plasma itself you know how do you shape it in a way that it is both uh, appealing but also effective in your vacuuming or or in a way that you can hide certain things or reveal certain things. Um, that, that's yeah. what I mostly enjoy when I'm trying to solve the problem of making a piece into an airtight vessel, making into a, a piece into a component to be pulled under vacuum. Yeah. And I, I kind of find that the, the knowledge around neon tends to be kind of very, very hillbilly level. You know, I, I mean, my, my background is, is, uh, I, you know, I kind of hang out with a lot of technology, technology people and, you know, studying math and computers and, uh, tends to be so much more technical. My world tends to be more technical and, uh, neon, um, the, the people that I know it, the knowledge tends to be kind of, you know, an oral history almost. And, 
kind of a little of that and a little of that and a little more of this and a little more of that. And uh, it tends to be kind of flowing more from an intuition rather than a technical side. That's what I find, uh, especially among uh, sign makers. Um, I've apprenticed to to Bill Concanon. I worked in his neon, his sign shop for a while. His uh, He's worked in the industry uh, about 35 years now. He was, um, he's an amazing artist on his own. You know, he makes his living making signage, but, uh, he worked back when, uh, industrial light and magic was using practical effects in their movie making. He didn't, he, I think he's pretty much the only one was doing neon for any of their effects that were model building at scale. So anything, any industrial light and magic movie that you saw that had, you know, sweeping scenes of, of, um, Los Angeles, I mean, uh, uh, Las Vegas, uh, I saw these models that he built, just incredible, incredible work. Six millimeter glass with these teeny tiny little six millimeter electrodes and how he could tuck those behind the signs and make them fit. And I don't even know how you can get those to, to, you can't just, it's not rubbery, it's made of glass, so you can't just wrap it around the sign. It's just really incredible, um, his his ability to make things. so I apprenticed to him, and he really gave me the skill and how to make a, a finished product, how to do it safely, how to make it um, polished, professional, uh, look good, and and um, yeah. So uh, I, you know, I worked for him as an apprentice. You know, the apprentices sweep floors, and uh, you know, they they screw the screws in. They don't they don't get to do the the rock star stuff. They don't get to bend the glass and and that kind of stuff. I didn't really have the skill anyway, so I just watched and learned him. He's quite quite the master. Um, and then the, another artist that I apprenticed to uh, when I was I was teaching at the Academy of Art. Here's more more classes that I took. You can really see that I have had a long lifelong obsession. And once I once I got my hands on neon, really kind of captured me. But uh, I was teaching computer graphics at the Academy of Art, which is um, uh, one one of really great school for learning about computer graphics for the film industry. So I was teaching um, computer graphics for film, but as a faculty member, I had access to classes that they taught there, and they taught um, they taught uh, neon there every other semester, or yeah, every other semester. And that's where I met Bill, uh, and I also met David Svensson there, and uh, I think he's probably the most influential artist in neon. Uh, his stuff is so organic; I really relate to that. Um, I really love his, uh, his snakes and his, uh, his little salamanders and the things he does, um, that are, that are just, that reflect nature in glass. Glass is so, it's so fluid and organic. Um, I really, really love his artwork. So I, I worked with him for a semester and, um, just learned a lot about really pushing the glass. Uh, I don't think anyone's pushing the glass quite as hard as he is. He was, and he was doing, you know, pushing lead glass which is what I've been doing. Uh, yeah, he's, uh, it was, it was such an honor to work with such an amazing, amazing artist. So, um, yeah, he taught me uh, a technique of you, you can sculpt a sculpt something in clay and then make a plaster mold from that. And then you can use that plaster mold to, uh, you, you, you know, stick a piece of hot glass in there, cover it up, and then blow into the glass real hard, and it will take the form of that shape in there. And I've done a number of pieces with that technique. That was just amazing. He was doing these really fun things where you would get plastic toys. He had a – this is one of his lizard pieces. He had this plastic lizard, and he cut the legs off of it and took a mold from that, and then uh, he could put glass in there and, and blow, and it would take on the, this all the details of that plastic toy and then he would come back in and add the legs later you know that would be the legs would be too hard of course to do in a mold for glass but he could come in and put the legs in and he's done some just really stunning pieces with that that idea so um yeah he's he's a big influence uh i hope i hope he's hearing this podcast and realizes because i've hardly talked to him in the last few years because i've been out of been raising a family as, as he has too. But, um, Mm -hmm. you know, we, we don't always know those, the, uh, the influence we have on people, but yeah, I admire him greatly. Yeah. I've been trying to get in contact with him as well. Uh, haven't quite heard anything back from just yet. 
but uh, he's one of the people on my list that I've been told by numerous other people that I should get on the con- on the podcast and talk to. Yeah, he's he's quite amazing. Um, I I I love that he does these totem works as well, which are very spiritual, and he incorporates neon into those. And I I just yeah I I love that because that's again it's he just it inspires me on how you can bring these organic things together that you you wouldn't otherwise think as that they would they would be they would make sense together i mean these totems that he does are so they're so ancient and so very very organic and to to combine uh neon with that it it just it it works in a way that you don't expect and it's it's really neat to see that so yeah that that'll be a great a great podcast he's got a lot of things going on with him as well mm mm-hmm. mhm a lot, of, a lot of different aspects to, to who he is. You know, it's only had just found out about you through the Plasma Appreciation Society, also the Plasma Art Alliance. It was just a post that was posted uh, of your work that made me jump to uh, invite you on the podcast here. Um, I, I appreciate being involved in both the Plasma Appreciation Society and Plasma Art Alliance because it's allowed me that access to so many more people who have interest or are working in neon. Yeah, it was, it was, it was Bruce Suba that, that told me that I better, better get on there. Um, cause I know that he's been posting stuff and I, and I, you know, like I said, I've been out of this for 10 years, you know, 10 years ago, it was a very, very different world. You know, YouTube wasn't out. Uh, the internet was just a very different place. It was the neon L list. I don't know. Probably some of your your subscribers remember that. Um, I mean, it was just an email list, and uh, you know you could get it as a as a um, a summary, and you could get the individual emails. And um, you know, I, I I I mostly lurked on that list and read read stuff on there because I didn't have, you know, I was still just absorbing and learning, so I didn't have as much to contribute back then. But the internet has changed. I mean, Facebook didn't exist back then, so there was no such thing as having a Facebook page and a, and a way to share, to share this knowledge. Um, and I, and I think that that's, I think that this, the sharing of the knowledge, especially now is so critically important because, uh, I mean, LEDs are taking over the, the, the neon space. I mean, it, it, neon was so widespread because it couldn't be shipped. And so kind of every town that had any kind of neon signs had to have someone, you know, some, some person in the garage making neon, uh, to support the town. So it was very widespread in these little tiny shops, but now that uh, LEDs have taken over, these shops are closing rapidly, and I, I really hope that it doesn't die like photography is, has kind of uh, turned gone the way of the dinosaurs. It's it's really hard for you know it's hard for photography to survive, and I, I neon requires so much technology and and uh, tools and materials that are specific to neon. I mean, the glass is not used anywhere else in any other industry and the, the transformers aren't used for anything else. And if neon goes away of the dinosaurs, these things will, will fade and become obsolete. And I think that'll be a big shame. Uh, it's such a, it's such an amazing, it's such an amazing art form. So I guess what I, what I'm trying to say with that is that I think it's really important that, that, uh, we, sh- we share our knowledge of how to do these things. We share the knowledge of how to, to bend the glass and how to make the things that we're, that we're making it's important to share that knowledge because uh, that needs that knowledge needs to be archived. It needs to be uh, available to future generations, and the internet has this great potential to archive this for the future. Mm-hmm. I think that was a, a good note. A good note to end on. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm finding that uh, like Bruce, I have, I've had these long talks with Bruce about uh, these Nixie tubes and how they're made, and uh, you know, he said that uh, you know there was someone who'd reverse engineered the um, the, is it Aerolux? I think the Aerolux light bulbs, the ones with little flowers in there. He'd figured out how to do those, and um, but he was very secretive in in uh, the knowledge for that. And now he's passed away, and you know Bruce is kind of frustrated with that 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 knowledge now died with him. And so if anyone wanted to to you take that on and and make art with that, that knowledge is has been lost. And um, so I've been looking out there, and there are a lot of people that have made Nixie tubes, and I'm very excited that people are showing how to how to do that and, you know doing stuff I, I always you know when I um I, I I came up with a technology in Burning Man 
uh, I won't get into it too much, but I, I learned to set water fountains on fire and no one had ever done that before. And I thought a lot about whether I should patent this technology. Mm-hmm. And I realized that the technology is kind of in the fabric of, of reality. It's that technology, how to do that is, is there to be discovered because it was discovered at one time, but the technology is not really the important part. It really is the art. And that's not really something even, it's not something patentable, but it's not really even something stealable. The art and making the art really comes from inside each of us. And that is not something anybody can steal. It, it has to do with that passion and that drive that we have to make these things. And I don't think we should worry too much about other people stealing that from us. That, that's our expression. And someone who's passionate about art and makes good art is going to succeed on their, on their passion and their love. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I don't know, I just feel like this is a community and that we need to share, share these things so that, um, so that we can all express ourselves from light, light our own lights from inside. <laughs> yeah. I really appreciate you being able to take the time, uh, especially with our previous, uh, um, technical difficulties. Um, is there any, any way we can see or view your work? Do you have a website that's available or something where we can see images <laughs> of your work or? You know, I do. And I'm so embarrassed to say I haven't touched that website in about 15 years. I have things up there that are, you know, before YouTube. It's really kind of funny. I I really need to revamp it. But um, uh, I just don't have the time to redo my website. I've been posting things to G+, though. I know, you know, who who's on G+. Nobody's on G+, just me and a couple other people. But... <laughs> But I do I do post stuff on G plus and um, now that I see these these uh, wonderful communities on Facebook I'll try to I'll try to post my stuff there as well. Um, I do have an email list for the Bang you know Bang group and I post things there every once in a while. Uh, sometimes I feel like I'm talking to the ether, but every once in a while someone will respond and so I know that <laughs> no, there are people out there alive listening to my ramblings. Mm-hmm. But um, I'll try to be more active on the on the Facebook page. But um, so. Yeah, my website is uh, burningideas.com slash bang, B-A-N-G. It's all lowercase. If you go to burningideas.com, you, there's a link there that you can click on. But it's uh, So you can sign up for the email list there and contact me through there. All right, cool. Again, thank you for coming on to the show. And uh, I'm pretty sure you'll be part of the discussion as this keeps rolling on. Yeah, I'm kind of coming back into it. So now that I'm more active, I'm I, I'm feeling that desire to connect with uh, other other artists out there and learn from the people out there as well. And thank you so much for having me on the show. Um, yeah, I, I I I feel like I still have so much to learn. Um, I, I'm not very much of a big name right now, but I but I I want to get back into it and make stuff. Thank you for listening to the Tammy Lightning Podcast. I'd like to thank Kiki Jewel for taking the time to talk with us after a long day, as scheduling these podcasts can be challenging, especially when we are several time zones away and run on very different schedules. And I'm excited to continue talking with her about our new ideas and projects. Also, I'd like to thank Pittsburgh Glassner for supporting me as a place of research and inspiration, as well as encouraging me to pursue this project as well as the Plasma Art Alliance, where I have an access to a well of knowledge and connects me to some amazing people, those of which I cannot do this podcast without. Keep an eye out for more classes at Pittsburgh Glass Center as we work to provide a space for learning Neon and Plasma. For more information on the two-night Neon and Plasma Globe workshop and the summer intensive with Wayne Stradman and Mundy Hepburn, please check it out on the web at www.pittsburghglasscenter.org or call our studio at 412-365-2145. If you'd like to support this podcast and this project, simply go to percyeccles.com and look for Taming Lightning, or by typing in taminglightning.net and click subscribe. Later, there will probably be other options in the future, but for now, like, share, comment, and subscribe. See you next time. The outro is re-entry by lapse. 
Laps a Chicago-based artist whose work can only be described as a remedy for time consisting of motion and sound. If you give his music a listen, you'll understand exactly what that means. Check out his music on Facebook, SoundCloud, YouTube, and Bandcamp. <laughs> 